in and then uh, once we... we're ready. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our next inst current installment uh, today of Great Decisions 2021, uh, Brexit and the European Union. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Gabriella Marin Thornton. Uh, I'll introduce her, but first, uh, let me uh, tell everyone uh, my usual announcement that this lecture series is a collaboration of the League of Women Voters of Tyler Smith County, the AAUW, the American Association of University Women of Tyler, the Tyler Public Library, and the Foreign Policy Association. I am Jeffrey Crean, I will be your host, and our guest today speaking, as I said, on Brexit and the European Union will be uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Gabriella Marin Thornton. Uh, Dr. Gabriella Marin Thornton is an instructional associate professor of international affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas a and University. She received both her MA and her PhD in international studies from the University of Miami. She teaches classes on international politics and theory and practice, the European Union and NATO. Dr. Thornton's work has been published uh, in such peer-reviewed venues as International Politics, European Perspectives in Politics and Society, uh, Oxford Bibliographies, and Republic of Letters Publishing. Her research focuses on international relations, transatlantic security, the European Union, and Romani issues. So she's highly qualified, and you're definitely in for a treat today uh, on this topic. She has also published opinion pieces in The Conversation U.S., The Washington Post, The Diplomatic Courier, and the national interest among other venues and has given invited lectures and roundtable presentations in Sweden, Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Romania, and now Tyler, Texas. So with that, I offer the floor to Professor uh, Gabriella Marin Thornton uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Jeff actually told you, my name is Gabriela Marin Thornton. I just want to tell you, I was born and raised in Romania. So that's from where my accent is coming. And um, I want to thank you all for being today here. For me, it is a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. So without further ado, I'm going to try to do um, several things. One, I am going to look back and ask why the referendum on Brexit happened during Prime Minister David Cameron tenure. Then I am going to quickly go through a timetable and come to the present day and talk about the consequences, which are very important on UK the, and the European Union and possible larger consequences that may be on the international system as a whole. So I have only 20 minutes. I will go very quickly and then I will be very pleased to entertain your questions. So, uh, most of us know that actually the Brexit referendum took place in 2016. Before that, um, one wants to remember that in 2015, the European Union faced the worst migration crisis in its history, particularly people coming from the Middle East, entering through the Mediterranean, through the Balkan routes, uh, through Turkey routes, sometimes through Spanish routes less, and trying to get more into the European Union in countries such as Germany and further in Nordic countries and in the UK. For a long time, uh, the uh, UK Independence Party um, came to know, uh, we, know uh, we know it as UKIP. Uh, led by Nigel Farage, who was actually an European parliamentarian, argued uh, that the European Union, it is uh, something that takes sovereignty from the state. That's very true. I mean, if you want to part of the, be part of the European Union, there is a lot of delegation of sovereignty. And Great Britain basically should not be here, there. In 2000, since 2012 to 2015, UKIP as a party grew and started to challenge the rhetoric of the Tory uh, um, government. Um, I'm not going to go into this nitty gritty detail, but David Cameron decides in 2016 to call for a referendum of staying or leaving. 
the European Union. I remember in 2015, I was lecturing at Free University in Berlin, and the people whom I talked to did not believe that the result of the referendum is going to be yes. And I don't think I believe that either, although I, I like to praise myself, they kind of feel those things, reading so much about and traveling in Europe, but I didn't either. So um, the result of the referendum was yes, um, best of my recollection must have been um, 51.9, something like that, to uh, 48 point something, yes. Um, it was a surprise for Cameroon, who probably will go in the history of Great Britain like the worst prime minister. In 2016, actually, he resigned and Theresa May came. So lots of reasons were vehiculated for actually why no. One that is never touched about, it's actually the public didn't know exactly what they are voting for. And how do we know that? We know because after the referendum and after the result came no, actually the most Google thing in the world was what is the European Union? They were trying to find out in Great Britain, why did they vote no to something? So, um, but to make the, uh, wash, um, the long story short, a lot of scholars and policy analysts attribute that to uh, anti-immigration sentiments, to economic sentiments, and to a clearly big lie that Boris Johnson, the, uh, the present prime minister, vehiculated all over Great Britain that somehow they pay the European Union and they get less in exchange when it comes to money. He had a big bus with the amount that supposedly UK was paying to the European Union. That was not true. Actually, UK was getting more money from the European Union because the European Union not only was paying for developmental programs um, in Wales, uh, some in Scotland, but strongly was paying for the peace process in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know, most people didn't know. Apparently, they woke up the very next morning in some uh, Wales places to find out that there will be cut in the future from the funds that the European Union was offering them from development. Nevertheless, at that time, people vehiculated two important things. Other countries will follow and the Eurosceptics celebrated. What a great thing. We did have a clause, Article 50 was triggered uh, to exit the European Union in 2017. So, the Eurosceptic, well, well, everyone is going to uh, follow the British lead and everyone is going to get out of the European Union and we did it. We destroyed it. Yeah. Even my husband will come every morning with the Financial Times and putting on me and saying there is no European Union anymore. I said you wish. Uh, so what was happening um, at that time Indeed, countries were watching very closely, but we, don't, we didn't have any precedent. There is no other country that asked to go out of the European Union and we didn't have any procedure since the Treaty of Lisbon uh, came in place and Article 50 could, have, uh, could be triggered right now, at any, can be triggered, I should say, right now at any moment. Article 50 provides for a member to get out of the European Union if he wishes to do so. But you have to understand what you're getting out of after you're in. First of all, you have to get out and dismantle yourself from what we call common markets. Common markets do certain things, and I cannot emphasize enough. They displace the role of the national parliament parliaments in the areas where the common markets function. So basically this is heavy delegation of sovereignty and it's a heavy integration of their economies. So how are you going to dismantle yourself? So it provides, uh, Article 50 provides for two years. Well, it, it's not been two years since 2015. Great Britain is right now a country that does not belong to the European Union and that was done, happened just in the Christmas Eve, last 
Christmas Eve 2020, they reached an agreement with the European Union that entered in force in January 1st, 2021. So um, let me back off a little bit and emphasize again. Um, the idea was countries will follow suit, like Great Britain is going to be easy. And with that, the Eurosceptics in the European Union were very happy that we did away with this body. Now, <laughs> country didn't follow suit at all because they started to, uh, I should say member states of the European Union didn't follow suit at all, because they started to understand how tight they are in that body and how painful looking at the um, Great Britain negotiations um, it is to extract yourself from such, a, uh, uh, from such a body. Now, remember also, Great Britain had opt-outs, it was not part of the Euro, and it was not part of the Schengen space like, either, uh, like other countries. So I just can only imagine how bruising could have been for Great Britain to be more integrated, and that's the correct, we have various levels of integration, and to be part of the Euro area or to be part of the Schengen area. Nevertheless, um, from the European Union side, the negotiations for going out were conducted by Michel Barnier, who was the EU negotiator, former commissioner for trade. Um, the British, if you look back, they, they made it very clear that when we look at the four freedoms of common markets, freedom of goods, persons, services, you know, and capital, the British did not want the freedom of person. They don't want anyone to circulate free. As a EU citizen, there is a loose citizenship uh, there. You can freely circulate in any other country of the European Union. You can work in any other countries of the European Union. There are some caveats with respect to the new entering country, but uh, the new countries from Eastern Europe that enter, but they will get their uh, full rights. So you can reside in any country of the European Union, you can work in any country of the European Union, and even if you're not a native of that country, you are free to run for local election in any country that you wish. So if you look at Spain, uh, you have a lot of people in local places that basically are German and they move to Spain and they run for elections. So the British did not want to have that. On the one side, the population that voted no uh, if we look at the demographics, was older and they fully entertained, I think, and that's my personal opinion looking at the age, the dreams of empire, yeah? Uh, Great Britain cannot be tied in a body. It, it gotta be sovereign. It gotta, you know, I mean, to me, almost on the, the discourse like the Bevan plan after World War II, when Great Britain was trying to make itself into the third pole of power between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. They failed. Uh, so then several times they had to ask uh, to become part of the European Union. Um, uh, when they asked, uh, uh, French General uh, de Gaulle vetoed them twice. So um, finally they succeeded to enter in 73. They are out right now and the extraction has been very painful and the consequences are not fully understood. The treaty uh, of getting out is not fully negotiated. There are areas of services, security and other areas in which they did not negotiate yet, but they got what they wanted. So they think trade with the European Union without tariffs. And that is good. But the thing is that that is not simple either because the European Union will put up borders, which they didn't exist. So they will have to pass through borders and any products that they will enter in the European Union will have to have a certificate of, of origins, meaning they have to prove they will have a lot of people. Well, they don't have anything. A truck passed like from Texas to Louisiana. 
Right now, they will have border checks, even if they don't have tariffs. They will have to have certificate of origins that the produce is done, it's produced in, or the product is produced in um, Great Britain, and it's not coming from another place. We already see the impact on fishery. Uh, fishery was a big uh, negotiation point, and we see the impact on Scotland right now where they have small fishermen, you know, that used to just go and sell their products to the European Union. Right now, they are subject to all sorts of regulation, to all sorts, not tariffs, but regulations. And they may even um, go ahead and sell all this in Denmark and so forth. So we're having, we're seeing right now, uh, immediately after January, discontent coming from some areas, other areas of London. And we don't know what's gonna happen to the service area because most, London is a big service hub in terms of capital and a lot of banking firms that already are talking to move out, move to Dublin, move to Frankfurt, get out because if there will be any barrier put on the services, it's gonna be difficult, the bank services or other stuff to circulate them, then there is no reason to be in London. The other problem is that actually Northern Ireland that is part uh, of Great Britain negotiated, they negotiated the deal that Northern Ireland is not gonna have the border that the part of, it's not gonna feel all this regulation, uh, that the other part of the UK has to do it. And why is that? Because actually you will create a harder border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And if you do that, they don't wanna put checkpoints there because if you do that, they are afraid that the peace uh, in Northern Ireland will be disturbed. So we have a country, a kaleidoscopic effect that we don't know where it's gonna go for England at this particular point, for Great Britain, I should say, at this particular point. However, we don't know. We do know that the European Union and I will close soon did not suffer yet. Nobody went out. If I will say to the contrary, nobody wants to go out looking. We do know that the European Union, it is and it will remain the largest trading bloc of the world in terms of trading being one single country actually. So if you want to negotiate trade deal with European Union, with the Italians, you don't go to Rome, you, you go to Brussels. Or if you want to negotiate big trade deals or something in Spain, you still go to Brussels. So they can do that. The British uh, are happy right now because they will be free to negotiate a trade deal and trade deals on their own right now. But, one thing very interesting, and I'm, I'm not sure they knew what they were, because during the negotiation, they tried to reach to other countries, telling them, we want a free trade with uh, you. And other countries were saying, no, I'm sorry, until you extract yourself from the European Union and you fulfill your obligation, we're not gonna deal with you. Right now, they are in the position to deal with that. And my question will be, I'm not sure what they will export. And if the services go out on London or London gets a special treatment from the European Union, how their economy is going to uh, compete on an international economy where large blocks like the United States of America, China and the European Union throw their muscles around. So, how should I close here? In my uh, humble interpretation, was that a good mood, uh, move from the part of UK? Absolutely not. Um, it was a move because the rhetoric, and it's a lot on rhetoric on the social media with respect to the European Union and has been so bad, partially, yes. Uh, anti-immigration, they are stealing our jobs. And, uh, you have to think that jobs go because of, um, uh, basically because of automation, because of technological developments, not because somebody comes and takes your job, but people have different opinions here uh, in general. So, and data um, doesn't quite show that those immigrants are taking the job may show an impact to the wages. 
But actually, the rhetoric was so bad uh, in Great Britain when they decided to vote no, they voted no. Um, I do think it's a very interesting um, proposition, they, and I will closely. The European Union offered on that deal to keep UK into the Erasmus program. And the Erasmus program, it's a program from uh, for young people. They go in another EU university on another EU member state, and they study. And the UK refused. And I'm not sure what are the reasons uh, that they refused. I can only speculate that, you know, you, they don't want their young generation to be too accustomed with the habits in the continent. Um, that is really something um, that damages their younger generation that statistically did not vote no. Voted yeah, um, did not vote yes, did not vote for leaving the European Union. The younger generation voted for staying in the European Union. And it's 121 and um, I would like you to, I would like to start a conversation. I thank you for listening to me and let's just start a conversation. I'm more than happy to entertain any questions that you have. Ah, very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Gabriella. Uh, so uh, uh, just a reminder, this is being recorded. And uh, the way this works is uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them uh, through the chat uh, window, uh, enter them, and then I will read them uh, for, uh, our, uh, for our speaker and she will answer. Uh, I will, uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll begin with some of my own questions uh, about your, your, your illuminating presentation. First, uh, you talked about how uh, there was a lot of campaign misinformation in the uh, uh, in the before the Brexit vote, and th that is indisputable. But there was a lot of uh, uh, material put out, especially by those who wanted to leave the European Union, which was demonstrably false. Uh, you also point out that a lot of the voters were quite were not quite fully informed when they were making their vote, as referenced by the uh, the Google uh, searches afterwards. So you have uninformed voters, you have um, misinformation. However, uh, in that long drawn out five plus year process of, of the Brexit post vote, you know, between when they vote and when they actually leave uh, and all the difficulties they faced, uh, there does not appear to have been, at least with polling and elections, a lot of regret uh, among uh, the, the, uh, the, those who supported Brexit, who supported leaving the European Union. You got a narrow majority, 52% voting for it. And then in continuously in polls, it showed that the same narrow majority had no regrets, and in fact, elected a uh, prime minister by resounding margins, Boris Johnson, who had helped lead the Brexit campaign. So how do you explain this then, this fact that, you know, they were lied to, they were in some ways kind of ignorant of what the consequences would be, yet in re retrospect, they have no regrets about this or don't appear to, the 52% who supported Brexit? I think, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your question. And actually, it, it is a very good question. I think it goes back to, back to much deeper resentment towards the continent and towards uh, immigration than even the disinformation campaign. I do think they didn't like that somehow uh, they were part of a block, and you see that in the, their behavior in the European Union, you know. They didn't like that they were part of a block that was setting rules for them. And that right now, if you look in the deal and what Boris Johnson said, they are happy they got uh, rid of the European Court of Justice. So the Tory basically, they never liked that. They did not agree on how to get out. As you know, it's a hard Brexit, it's a soft Brexit, how to negotiate the deal. But they wanted to go out. And how do I explain that? Jeffrey, my explanation is they, and I mentioned the Bevin plot, they think that the open seas will offer them again a chance to create or recreate a commonwealth or something that they have, something that they will lead. And that's my reading of the Tory. Now, how they will do that, you know, that's another question and remains to be seen if they can compete at this point. But I don't know, I think if I answer your question, they were determined. 
behind all this disinformation, they may have moved some voters in the, in the middle, but they were determined because of Great Britain's history, which you know very well, Jeffrey, huh? They were the one to offshore balance, to decide who's going to win on the continent. Mm -hmm. They were not the one historically to be told what to do by the continent. Right. And I think that weighed heavily in their decision. If you have another idea. Ah, very, I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, now I'll go, I have some questions from the audience. Uh, first, this is from Marilyn Wills, uh, and this relates to a question uh, I had. Uh, she, Marilyn asks, I'm not sure how immigration was impacted by the move from the EU, the move in this case from Britain leaving the EU. Uh, was it the easy movement between countries? Uh, so how, how, what was the impact of immigration on uh, the, the vote for Brexit? I think the question is, and in, uh, in, in this, can you, you referred in your presentation to something called the Schengen area. Uh, can you explain more what this is and how Britain was not part of it and how, uh, but still how people move within the EU and how they moved to Britain when Britain was in the EU and how that has changed now that Britain has left the EU. So talk about the freedom of movement or lack thereof uh, on this matter. So countries that are part of the Schengen, the Dublin Agreement, the Schengen area basically, in those EU countries, you can move without having a passport. You, I said you move, there are no borders basically. Borders were taken down right now, borders are back because of the COVID. Uh, so, but let's assume that we don't have the COVID crisis. So I remember I took also my students in, um, in Germany and we drove to Silo Heights and where the battle took place and this border with Poland and we crossed into Poland and they were asking, why is nobody asking us for passport? And I had them in my class and because I said, I told you there is no border. At this point, you, you can cross in Poland at any moment you want to. Actually, it was a police car and two policemen smoking cigarettes or something. They didn't even look at us. So there is no border. So that was the Schengen area. Now, during in the airport, you will have to show some kind of ID or go going through that line. Some of you who travel to Europe uh, can see that in their airport, you have actually uh, some um, security checks and pass uh, passport check that basically says EU citizens. And then it says other citizens. So uh, yes, my husband is not liking it because he has to uh, uh, stand on line with other citizens and he cannot go through the EU citizens. Well, you can show your ID card and just go, just go. Nobody is putting a stamp, nobody does anything. Great Britain was not part of the Schengen. They got an opt out and that was done because of their request. I mean, other countries were not part such as Greece and those were fears of terrorism and other type of entries uh, in there, but Great Britain chose not to be part of the, um, uh, of the Schengen area. Therefore, you need a passport, you know, to enter uh, in Great Britain. They, they will, coming from the European Union, I'm not talking, of course, you need a passport if you come from another country, but coming from, which the European Union calls anyone that it's outside of their area, third countries, in no relation, second countries are the candidates country, first countries are the ones that are members. So, um, right to the question here, uh, that was the Schengen area. How is the movement impacted right now? Now, first of all, Despite the Schengen area, in 2015, when the immigration crisis came, uh, there were very, the European Commission tried to intervene and impose a quota of taking immigrants in and invoke the principle of solidarity in the European Union. So the immigrants will be distributed somehow across the European Union and Greece and Italy and other countries would not be overwhelmed. We all know the welcome of Merkel and the one million 
immigrants that actually Germany took in, and right now it's kind of paying off, believe it or not. Angela Merkel was highly criticized by the Alternative for Deutschland and other right parties in Germany, but it's starting to pay off. Those immigrants are starting to be integrated. So uh, they went to Calais in France, they, and they were trying to get in Great Britain, and that did not basically play a good role. The other problem there with immigration that they wanted to stop is somebody that comes from a country of Romania, which is the has the largest minority, uh, the largest population of gypsy that we right now called Roma uh, politically, to be correct, gypsy being a derogatory term in the European Union right now. Those people, when Eastern European countries, Hungary, Bulgaria has them uh, too, became members of the European Union, they became basically part of the European Union because they are citizens of Romania and they migrated west. And the migration of uh, Roma people had also an impact. You can find tons of YouTube videos made in Great Britain about get these people out of here. They just came somehow and this morphism of who's a Roma, who's a Romanian, just that we don't even want the Romanians. We don't want, want anybody coming from Eastern Europe right now. That has been, so Romania, Bulgaria joined in 2007, that has been a constant thing about immigration because having the Romanian passport, a Bulgarian passport, a Hungarian passport, and being a member of the European Union guaranteed them actually entrance and stay on the territory of Great Britain. For a while did not guarantee work because those countries phase in work um, condition, they are newcomers. So you have this influx of Roma people who are basically the most discriminated minority in the world to the best I can tell at this point. An influx of people coming from the Middle East and they were somehow moving to the European Union and that has been something that they didn't want. Uh, right now, how it's impacted? Well, if you are a EU national right now, basically you come from any other country, you cannot leave. You cannot work or live according to the treaty on the British territory anymore. You need a working visa, which in the past was not there. You can enter but you cannot stay more than 90 days in a period of 180 days. So you gotta go back from where you came. So there are, there are some restrictions put to the movement of people in order to make sure that it's, they will not be flooded with immigrants. And you have a lot of literature that I teach from to show how high the discrimination in Great Britain, it's against Eastern Europeans, uh, Romani people, not only uh, people coming from the Middle East. Uh, Muslims, which they securitized as a threat, terrorism. Uh, very good, okay. Uh, so uh, now uh, we will look at uh, uh, the next question. We have more questions here, one from Jackie. Uh, and this is uh, also anticipating what one of my questions would have been. Was there a marked difference among the votes on Brexit in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales? Yes, we know, we know, we all know that it was. Basically, if you look at Scotland and take Scotland separately, they did not vote to get out of the European Union. If you look at Ireland, they did not vote to um, get out of the European Union, if you look at their votes. If you look at well, Wales, surprise, surprise, we did not expect them to vote to get out of the European Union, but they did. And we looked for the reason there, and we found that a lot of former um, British military, actually, when they retired, they moved to Wales. They may have tilted the vote there. So yes, it was, and London separately, uh, did not vote to get out of the European Union, but it was England massively right. that voted for that. And we go back to the historical explanation, Jeffrey, I think that we touched upon here, who ruled 
uh, who I mean, who rules in a way. And the rule is not a word. It's it's too uh, much of a realist word to, to use. But you know, the most powerful group in UK it remains the English. And the Scots did not uh, want to get out. They have a very good relation with the European Union. They are highly impacted right now. Nicholas, but their referendum for independence under Nicholas Sturgeon failed. Um, I do remember a clip on YouTube of a Scottish parliamentarian that brought tears into my eyes, asking the European Union not to leave down Scotland because Scotland always supported the union. They need the European Union because their economy is weaker. They need the help and they need to trade. Yeah, very good. So uh, uh, following up on that, before we get to the additional questions, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Cameron had called uh, Prime, Prime Minister Cameron for a referendum on Scottish independence uh, and it narrowly uh, failed. Uh, and then he did, that's part of why he did the same on the EU. It, that did not go the way he expected it to go. So in that case, that was a surprise, uh, uh, very unpleasant surprise for him. Uh, what are the chances in the next five to 10 years that Scotland tries to have a rerun of the referendum and might it go differently? Uh, just to say, uh, to go back to uh, the Scottish referendum, basically Cameron, uh, was very scared that actually they will get out. The result will right. be that. one, if I, my memory serves me right, one day before the referendum, he made the speech threatening them to cut them, to cut their currency, to cut, I mean, all sorts of threat, threats that he, he just put on the Scots. May have tilted the result or not, Jeffrey, I have no evidence, but that speech is sounded to me desperate. He was really afraid and the referendum really narrowly failed. Now your question, what is going to be the impact of five, 10 years from now and if we expect a referendum? And the answer I think is very simple here, Jeffrey, if the UK can economically perform and deliver, they may stay. Very if it doesn't, we may see another referendum. Mm -hmm. Very that, good. Uh, excellent. Okay, so a question from Tammy. Uh, what are your thoughts on the long-term economic uh, factors from or impact from breaking uh, from the EU for the United Kingdom? So what do you, I mean, this is obviously a massive question, which has been, uh, you know, bedeviling political scientists and economics since 2015. Uh, so what, what, in your opinion, and from what you've read and studied, do you think the impact will be on Great Britain of Brexit on their economy? Uh, you know, it's hard to make predictions and I'm not, I'm not particularly, I don't have a degree in economics to look, you know, I read, Jeffrey, I, I, I you know, I, I don't have my own set of data, mm -hmm. but from uh, what I read, I think it's going to take them a long time to recover and to find a way to become a player in international economy. They will suffer. And I was reading article in which, you know what, I mean, they will have to have a lot of, you know, not get a lot of produce from the European Union. They may have go, to go back to eating strawberries only in the summer and Brussels sprouts in the winter if uh, the economy does not kick up and does not, and it's hard to say if those firms are going to move banking systems from London, mm -hmm. the impact will be grave on their economy. If they somehow stay in London, the services that the British produce will bring money in. Right. So it's hard to predict, but it's contingent on what London is gonna do, what the banking sector is gonna do, which we don't know at this point. Very good. Uh, now, getting uh, from the question of uh, the uh, Britain's uh, economic future uh, uh, to its uh, military and strategic future, this was a question from Marilyn. Uh, you mentioned uh, the military. Uh, how does this exit impact both the EU and Britain militarily? So what are the security ramifications of the uh, Brexit? Let me preface that quickly by saying that for since 1973, when they came into the European Union, when Great Britain came in the European Union, till 1998, when the San Malo Initiative came into being for the creation of an autonomous military arm for Europe, 
the British constantly veto any military and security development in the European Union. They veto constantly, and they were what General de Gaulle said they will be, the Trojan Wars. They try to stop any kind of integration, use their veto power to stop any kind of military developments that will belong to the Union. And we have discussions like this in NATO. Why do Americans have to um, uh, defend the Europeans? Why the Europeans don't do something for themselves? Well, look, when I teach my classes, I go initiative by initiative, from San Malo to other the, uh, 2003 initiative in Brussels, the efforts of creating actually uh, a more independent European military to help uh, NATO one would we'll say to decouple, but that's a total discussion. <laughs> it's a totally different discussion. But everything was vetoed by the British on the basis that military and security affairs are to be discussed in NATO. And then here we talk about potatoes in the European Union. We're not talking about this. <laughs> now, um, there were a flurry of articles that even I wrote one, <laughs> believe it or not, that came. Now that the British are out, and they came during the Trump administration, and the Trump administration is willing to somehow is talking about retreating or not being part of NATO, you know, that um, talk that was coming from the uh, Trump administration, Europeans don't pay uh, in NATO. Sure. There is talk right now in the European Union of saying, well, okay, right now you don't have the British to say no to your military developments and you don't have, uh, we had the Trump administration, why don't we go ahead and start and construct a, a strong military? Now, COVID-19 came and impacts heavily, impact, but I wanted to say that uh, there are in the European Union what we call PESCO projects, structured cooperation clause projects that came in the Lisbon Treaty, which allows for integration, military project and more military integration uh, in Europe when it comes to military integration and cooperation in Europe and PESCO projects are on the roll. Now, Great Britain did not negotiate all these things. So it remains to be seen where militarily will be, but we have to remember that those are different plans because they will stay in NATO. Yeah, so they can get out of NATO. So in terms of Europe, securities, they are via NATO in there. Now, in terms of what the Europeans would like to develop by themselves, I don't think they are there because they are not even in the data sharing program anymore. They need to ask, to the best of my understanding, when I read the agreement, they need to ask permission to read the data sharing something like that, you know, to, to be allowed. Uh, they are out of uh, Europol. Uh, and uh, agencies like that, uh, security uh, speaking, the European police, so, um, they are out of the European um, healthcare system. Once their healthcare cards, European healthcare cards, uh, there is an European healthcare system actually, um, different from the national systems. When their cards will disappear, they will not have that protection anymore. So if you travel in a Euro country and you have an accident or you want anything, you've got to pay. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, speaking of which, uh, uh, can you? Uh, I know there's been some tussling between Great Britain and the European Union over COVID vaccination and over arguments that the British are hoarding vaccines from them. So I was wondering, uh, you know, kind of ripped from the headline sort of question. Uh, can you explain some of that uh, dispute uh, to our audience? Yes. Uh, actually, it li it's linked to another dispute, Jeffrey. It's linked to the fact that under the common security and defense uh, policy of the European Union, we have 143 uh, basically EU embassies. They are called EU external services. They came into being with the Treaty of Lisbon, and when the treaty was negotiated, the British opposed the naming of those represent 
administrative, uh, it's an European exter external service, uh, naming them embassies. However, by then, the British were in the European Union and the high representative uh, for foreign policy was Catherine Ashton, under who is British, under her leadership, the European External Action Service started to open basically those services all over the world. We, they, they have a hundred in services like this in 143 countries, including in the US. <laughs> those services function like full embassies. For instance, if you are in Nigeria and you are a Bulgarian citizen, sure you are in the European Union, Bulgaria does not have an embassy, but you have an European external action <laughs> service, European External Action Service is going to give you the full protection and full services, just explain, that your embassy would have given to you if you would have been there, if I make sense. Yes. Yeah. Uh, since Great Britain get out, the European Union moved to open a European External Action Service with them. And the, Brits ref the British refused to give them the status of an embassy. It's the first refusal, all other 143 in the world, claiming that the European Union is not a state. Well, so we know Jeffrey is not, but this is how they advance the integration, yeah? Um, yeah, we've been recognized that our state in trade, we've been recognized right now with the European Act, External uh, Action Services, that um, uh, we kind of have the status of a state. So uh, the British refused to, uh, Cameroon refused the protection to the EU representative, um, call it uh, the head of the European uh, External Action Service. Uh, in Great Britain, that infuriated the European Union and some measures were taken with the delivery of vaccine, vaccines. Now that has been corrected. Okay. And I think it was a mistake because we're dealing with people's lives. Leave aside the diplomatic, that's been corrected. Very good. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just get a bit broader focus here about the meaning of the European Union for those countries that are still in it. Uh, you, as a Romanian, can you, uh, Romania, of course, worked very hard to qualify for EU membership uh, and to join along with many of its uh, neighbors uh, in the period uh, from the, uh, after the, uh, you know, uh, in, in the last 20 years. Uh, so what does the European Union mean to the people of, say, Romania? Uh, what, 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 how would they think of it? How would they define it? How would they explain it to outsiders about what impact it has on their life, uh, how they view it? Uh, perhaps I could have answered better this question um, five years ago, six years ago. It is a little bit more difficult to answer it because I think in Eastern Europe, the Russian propaganda is becoming uh, more successful. But the European Union, meant a lot for Romania and um, meant a lot in terms of identity, which meant a lot for all Eastern European countries to be recognized be as being Europeans, not those people left uh, behind the wall that nobody cares about. Uh, um, so it does. It means a lot for Hungary that criticizes right now the European Union, but it means a lot uh, because the Austro-Hungarian Empire at a certain moment was at the heart of Europe, yeah? Um, but I, I just want to describe a clear incident in Romania. I believe the year was 2017 when the Romanian government wanted to pass a um, law that will allow basically will not consider or punish any bribe that politician will take smaller than $48,000 or something like that. And <laughs> I mean, this is insane. And the law uh, was supposed to give a lot of politicians that were caught of taking bribe a pass. Now, the opposition at that point, which uh, the Liberal Party called the Liberal Party in Romania, it's actually a center-right party because <laughs> the Social Democrats are at the left. So the Liberal Party is a center-right party. Went to the European Union, opened and used all channel possible to stop that, including the largest demonstration in the streets organized since actually the 
uh, the Romanian Revolution, which was bloody in 1989. Those demonstrations are actually, if you see the image, it's unbelievable. And uh, they did all uh, they could, those demonstrators, claiming that you cannot pass such laws belonging to the European Union. And guess what? The street won. They did. That decree, decree. So this is just an instance. But what it means for the people is what it means for my friends. Look, I mean, they travel all over the places. I'm looking on my Facebook and they are in Italy and they are in Spain and they are in Vienna. And I'm thinking, okay, for us, it's a lot of money to go there. Yes. So the free circulation, the idea for young people, the idea that you, young people speak two or three languages right now that they can go and study is a good thing but it's a wonderful thing but i, I really want to say that um there is russian propaganda like all over europe at this point trying to you know quiet the love for brussels and the love for america yes uh, now question from jackie uh, does the rise of right-wing nationalism in some eu countries such as germany uh, but by no means only germany uh impact the eu to some extent of course i mean uh it raises the impact is that basically you see a rise on euro skepticism because if you have the alternative for Deutschland winning votes and gathering people, so there will be more Eurosceptics. If you look at France right now, in President Macron on the election, I thought he's going to win it by a um, smaller margin. Actually, he won it by a larger margin than I expected. Right now, he's running neck and neck with Marine Le Pen. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it does. Uh, it's the discourse that we know. We just don't want to get another immigrant crisis. We just don't want those people to move all over the borders. We just, they destroy our culture because those things with the immigrants generally goes, go to the heart of culture. They do something in order to destroy a culture that people think, uh, hold is dear. That, that's what it is. It's part of people's identity. Although people don't realize that cultures change. They are not static like a car. They don't change overnight, but they will change anyway. You can't stop that. Dear. But yes, the answer is yes. And I said it. Why? They become powerful. They have seats in parliament. Right now, they have seats in the European parliament, basically parties like that. Even Golden Dawn. In in Greece. 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 Yeah, God sits. Um, and um, 2015 European elections, uh, I'm not sure when Golden Dawn got seats in the European Parliament. Yes, and those are Eurosceptic parties that are represented actually in the European Parliament. Parliamentarians who are paid by the European Union in order to say we want to destroy the European Union. Yes, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Eurosceptics biting the hand that feeds them in that regard, I'd like to bring up uh, Hungary, uh, your neighbor to the, uh, Romania's neighbor to the West, uh, and uh, Viktor Orban, its leader, who is a uh, leading Eurosceptic, uh, very much uh, Russophile, uh, you know, pro-Putin and so forth, uh, yet uh, uh, in, in creating a problem for the EU in the sense that uh, how do you deal with someone like him who is hostile to the EU, at the same time gets a lot of money from the EU, yet the EU is unable to use that leverage to kind of rein him in. How does the EU deal with a figure like a Eurosceptic like uh, Orban uh, in, in, uh, in, in your opinion? And so I'd like you to explain that to our audience. Um, it's difficult. First of all, it's difficult. So in remember the countries in Eastern Europe that joined the European Union, they had to sign the Acquis Communitaire which was not the case with the founding countries. And that included, included criteria, you have to have a free market economy, you have to have a functioning democracy, and you have to have protection of minorities. Now, we are seeing um, democratic authoritarian trends in Hungary pretty clear uh, in Orban. And as you pointed out, a friend of Miss Put, uh, of Miss, <laughs> Miss Putin or Mr. Putin, yeah, friend of Mr. Putin, Jeff. Uh, but look, there is a way of dealing, but we have the problem 
it, it, it shows the shortcoming of a body that is not a federation fully. I, I call it a quasi-federation. People hate the word. They don't want to call it like that, but it is in certain areas. But it's not a full federation. Here's what it happened. If you want to apply some kind of sanction on a member, on Hungary, you will have to have a unanimity vote of the other members. Now, in this case, Poland, which is in the same situation, democracy is going back, but they are not cozy with Putin. Uh, right. Democracy is going back. Uh, doesn't want to vote against Hungary because of those authoritarian trends in both countries. So you have Hungary having the back of Poland and Poland having the back of the Hungarians. And it's very, very difficult to deal with this. Can you, on certain basis, can the commission bring a European state to the European Court of Justice by not respecting the European community law? Yes, you can. But the commission actually not necessary, but has more power when in economic matters. You know, and we know they bring to the Court of Justice Microsoft and they find them again. And right now, Google, they own antitrust thing with Google and every Android phone that you buy in Europe right now needs to have five search engines to cut on the Google mon monopoly. But just uh, answer your question. It is difficult. It's almost impossible at this because um, you have two states in there that are having each other's back. Yeah. And... <laughs> Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude by asking you, uh, we talked about the effect of Brexit on uh, Britain leaving the European Union, on Great Britain. Uh, what is the effect of the Brexit process, do you think, in your expert opinion, on the remaining 26 members of the European Union and on the future of the EU? I think that the remaining for the moment, because we know attitude change, things could happen, you know, this COVID is just ravaging. Uh, God forbid we may have another immigration crisis. We don't know what's the stability in the Middle East at this particular point. But the, the immediate effect right now, Jeff, is we don't want to get out of the European Union. And we're still watching Great Britain, but we don't want to tank like this. Uh, so the immediate effect, even if you look at the polls in Hungary, the population doesn't want to go out of the European Union. So we don't want to go, the immediate effect right now, or short-term effect, call it, is we don't want to get uh, out of the European Union. And I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question? Uh, that was the main part. What was, uh, in terms of uh, strengthening, weakening, uh, how has, uh, no, I, I think, uh, how weakened. has it... Yeah. it no, was? it didn't. No. Okay. So. Yes, uh, very good. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, we will uh, conclude uh, this week's presentation. Thank you to Professor Thornton uh, for her uh, wonderful presentation and for uh, all of you who asked questions uh, and for this uh, Q&A part. So uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who participated uh, and uh, all of you who uh, may be watching in the future on YouTube and uh, uh, on, the, uh, on this recorded presentation and join us uh, again uh, for another presentation next Thursday. Uh, and uh, thank you for all who are here. Uh, thank you again to uh, Gabriella and uh, uh, have a good uh, weekend, everyone. Okay, are we still recording?